Welcome to Arnie's Class Podcast. I'm Arnie Aniel. I'm an HR development consultant, an international public speaker, a workshop facilitator, a coach, and an educator. Life is a great opportunity, and we all learn life lessons every day. This podcast is all about those lessons. Lessons like gratitude, confidence, happiness, mindset, and a lot more. Learning without action is information. Learning with action is transformation. Join me. Learn and transform yourself into a better you. Life mates, what is your dream home? Is it a home with a beautiful garden, a swimming pool? Or is it a home with beautiful, expensive furniture? A home with five bedrooms, big kitchen? What's your dream home? For me, a home is a place that you should be able to find comfort, safety, and security. It doesn't matter whether it's big or small. Home is a place and space where you should be able to share love, experience joy, and have peace of mind, especially when you go to bed and sleep. I hope that wherever you live now, whatever kind of home you have, I just hope that you have the love, joy, and peace, and you share that place and space with the people that matter to you and that you love. Life Mates, another episode. And in this episode, I'm sure a lot of you will be very, very interested. And my special guest is a feng shui consultant, a speaker, and an author. She helps her clients to turn their current homes into dream homes where they can be happy with the people they love. Only the description. I know you're already interested and can't wait to hear what she's going to say. So please welcome my very special guest, Moni Castaneda. Hi, Moni. Hey, Arnie. Welcome to Arnie's class. I'm very excited. Me too. <laughs> so let's start right away because I'm sure my life mates, as I call my listeners, they want to learn more about feng shui. How will you define it? I, I know, of course, we can Google it, but how will you define sure, it? Of course, yeah. <laughs> the is the ancient East Asian art of placement. So basically, Feng Shui teaches you what to put where and in what color, shapes, and materials so that you can have, be happy, healthy, and successful. And uh, so, but there's also there's, um, a difference we need to make here. You know, there's two approaches to Feng Shui. One of them is to do Feng Shui as part of um, Chinese astrology and numerology. And the other way to practice feng shui is to do it as part of ancient Chinese medicine. So it's the second one, doing feng shui as a part of ancient Chinese medicine is the type that I practice. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Can you tell us more about it? Because normally people, they know about the first practice. Yes. But the second one, I believe, is not as common as the first one. For sure, yes. And so in the, you know, the five branches of ancient Chinese medicine are acupuncture that I think everybody is familiar with, right? Herbalism, um, Tai Chi or Qigong, and massage, and feng shui. And so those are the five branches of ancient uh, Chinese medicine or ancient East Asian medicine, right? And so these, uh, these, all these practices uh, have in common the same philosophy, which is ancient Chinese philosophy. And this philosophy is based on certain principles of healing. And, uh, and that's how uh, acupuncture is practiced. That's how all of the other practices are done. But feng shui at some point um, got, uh, so the, the, it split up and one of the branches developed more as astrology and numerology. And so this happened actually when there was a boom of growth in Chinese cities. So feng shui, um, in ancient times, you know, just was uh, concerned with the form. And, and there's a school called Form School Feng Shui. And so it looked at the shapes of the environment, right? And so the Feng Shui consultant would go and say, okay, you need to choose a site for your village or for your temple or for your house. 
with these conditions, you need to be close to water, but not at the same level of the water so you don't get flooded, right? Oh, yes. And then you need to have, <laughs> at the north, you need to have a mountain or a hill to protect you from the cold winds in the, in the winter that are coming from the north. Then on the sides, you need hill ranges because then you're going to have protection from the winds. And this is an ideal side that is called the armchair formation. So for thousands of years, feng shui was done in this way. But with the advent of cities, uh, there came this challenge that, okay, you know, now you can't, not everybody can find a hill to have behind them, right? Not everybody can find the hill ranges. And so one branch of feng shui uh, decided to, um, to use heaven luck more than earth luck. And so to use heaven luck, they connected to astrology and numerology. And then they started you know, doing calculations for the house and taking into consideration when the house was built and the astrological charts of the people who lived in the home. Wow. And, but another, <laughs> another branch of feng shui said, okay, you know, now, so we have all these houses really close to each other and people who are designed to live in connection with nature are now living in these boxes. So what do we do? And so their response was to say, hey, we need to create inside and outside of these homes in cities, the same natural conditions that create a harmonious natural environment. And that is then uh, practicing feng shui as a branch of Chinese medicine, follow all the, the principles of Chinese medicine. You know, for example, uh, the Tao is, uh, has to do with wholeness and completeness. So we wanna make sure that the floor plan is complete. Then you have the principle of the, the great Tai Chi, which is the yin and yang commonly called, right? And that's about finding balance, controlling excesses and deficiencies in the home, just like I would do in the person for their health. And then there's Qi, which is the life force. And that's the third principle, right? So you wanna make sure that there's enough Qi coming into the home and visiting all the areas of the home so that there's vitality and you don't get fatigued because one of the things that happens, you know, with this urban living is uh, that you are disconnected with nature. So there's a natural depletion of energy in, uh, in our buildings. And so you need to make sure that doesn't happen. You need to make sure there's enough sunlight and uh, uh, natural breezes coming in, right? And that you have plants and uh, all sorts of um, images uh, that create this, uh, this sense that you are living in a natural environment. And so, and then there's the principle of rhythm, right? And then there's the five elements. And, uh, and so there's nine principles. And that's, I have based my system to practice on Shea based in Chinese medicine is the, called the nine steps to feng shui system for that reason, because there's nine principles of healing. Oh, wow. Very detailed. <laughs> I, I didn't know that it's wow, that this is really like detailed like this. I'm very curious. You mentioned about helping your clients to turn their homes into okay. their dream homes. How do you do that, Moni? Yeah, well, uh, I do it by applying this system, right? And so a lot of, you know, a lot of people, I think most people, they want to live in a dream home. But their idea of a dream home is what they see on TV or the way, the way they see in a magazine, right? And they look at <laughs> yeah. their vision board and they look for a really expensive home and cut it out and put it on their vision board. And But that's not um, necessarily what's going to make them happy, right? Because right now they're living in a home and they can turn that home into a dream home where they can be happy with the people they love. And so what we do is we analyze the home based uh, on these principles, right? And so that the person can um, go uh, step by step. So very few people have, are like naturals for interior design. You know, I have some friends that they're just like, uh, they go into a space and they just see the possibilities. Uh, uh, but for yeah. most people, it's not... It's not uh, in um, the quality they were born with, right? But with feng shui, you can develop it. And so um, where you put a certain type of image, that depends on uh, what the image is gonna do for the space. So for example, or even mirrors, right? And so a typical example of yin and yang imbalance, excesses and deficiencies is the, the long and narrow hallway, right? So a hallway is a problem in feng shui because it's too narrow, so you feel constricted, and then it's long. It's too long compared to how wide it is, right? And so, and a, a common thing, I don't know where you live if this happens, but a common thing they do here in the United States is that they put a mirror at the end of the hallway. Yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah. I know some people yeah. they do, even in Asia. Yeah. So what they're doing is they're making that hallway twice 
as long. And they're exacerbating an excess, the excess of length, you know, they're exacerbating. Yeah. But if they move that mirror to the side of the hallway, then that hallway is going to feel like it's twice as wide, which would be a good thing, right? And so the kinds of images that you choose, you know, if you choose an image of, of a landscape with a lot of perspective, that is good for certain spots in the home, but not good for others. And images that are, have bright colors, large images, and like large figures, and they're very contrasted, they're good for other things in the home. So once you learn about these, uh, these types of images, where they're good and where they create problems, then everything flows in the home. Then when you go in, your eyes are guided, you know, and they circulate through the home and you appreciate the beauty. And the same thing applies, you know, to choosing decorations, to choosing window treatments like curtains, lamps. Everything is based on these nine principles of ancient Chinese philosophy that are at the base of ancient Chinese medicine. And so because everything that you do in your interior design has a purpose, the results are not just visible but you also can feel them, you know, you can feel the energy. And here's the thing, you know, in, uh, in Feng Shui, we talk about heaven luck, right? And earth luck. But uh, luck in the ancient Chinese philosophy is not chance. Oh. Luck is how healthy you are, right? Oh, that's and interesting. So it to, yes, it has to do with, with the quality of your health and the quality of your human energy field around you, like uh, what they used to call the aura the human energy field, right? And so luck in, in Chinese medicine, good or bad, is associated with how strong your energy is. And so what you want to do is you want to create an environment that strengthens your energy field so that you become luckier. Oh, yeah. Wow, that's very interesting. But, but Moni, have you experienced a client wherein you visited the home and then you said, mm, this is not the home for you? Is that possible? I have not, you know, because I know in the in the type of function that I was telling you, where they do the astrology and the numerology, right? Yes. They might they might do your uh, like your personal chart or your personal calculation, and they look at the house and they say, "Oh, this house is facing a really bad direction for you," right? And so, what happens to that person is that person becomes obsessed that they're going to have bad luck, and then it becomes a self realizing prophecy that they're going to because you know now they are convinced the home is bad for them they're not going to focus they're not going to concentrate they're going to be you know the the nervous system has uh, the two two settings you know one is the fa fight flight or freeze yes and the other setting of the nervous system is heal and digest and reflect and so the the fight flight or freeze that is uh, that shuts down the other side of your nervous system and so when you tell a person that, that a home is really bad for them uh, that's not good for them that creates bad luck and so i had a client that lived in a in a one bedroom apartment and the they hired the function consultant that did astrology and they told them that their bedroom was the zone of death for them and so when i arrived now when she hired me she had been sleeping on her sofa for six months, not sleeping well. And her bedroom had turned into a junk room because she was literally afraid to step into her bedroom, right? And so what I have seen is like when I work with people that uh, previously had hired the different type of function consultant and they're convinced the home is bad for them, I tell them, um, forget about that. You know, we're going to apply the nice system, system and we're going to turn this home in, into a home that is lucky for you, no matter what direction it faces. And so what has happened sometimes is that the person just really forgets about the direction and they start thriving in the home they live. And in a couple of occasions, uh, they were catapulted out of the home, but in a happy way. Okay. <laughs> so for example, you know, like one of my clients, she was convinced this home was, was really negative for her and nothing I told her uh, would convince her otherwise. So I told her, hey, follow these steps, you know, they just do step by step, just follow my advice. And then she was offered a huge uh, salary increase with, uh, with everything paid uh, to go move to a different city. And that's oh. what she did, you know? So like, like what I have seen is people actually end up moving, but in a good way, not based in fear, but based in success. So she was given a promotion with a huge salary bump and moved to another city that she actually liked better. 
But if she had focused too much on the idea that that house was bad for her because of the direction it was facing, uh, she probably would not have gotten the promotion. Wow. That's... You're asking really good questions. Yeah. <laughs> I have more. <laughs> okay. But Moni, let's let's move from one place to another in a, in a yes. home, right? Because you said... Yes. Because generally, we, we can't tell where they live at the moment, my listeners or my light mates, even myself. Yeah. I cannot show you my room and tell you like and ask you where should I put. So let's go from one place to another, one room after another. Like for example, in a living room. What do you suggest that should be in a living room to have? Because of course, sorry, Moni, my, mm-hmm. my focus here is for my light mates to live in a home, just like I said, a dream home where they can share love, peace, and joy. That's what I, I want here. So if there is something to be to be put or to be decorated in a living room, what is it? Yeah. So another great question. So I actually have a checklist that goes over all the putting together a living room from scratch, everything that you need in order to create that ambience that you want in the living room, right? And so the living room or the family room in feng shui, they're associated with a life area that we call fame, reputation, and social life. So when you set up your living room, it needs to be set up for social life, not for movie watching, not for playing video games. And so the the biggest mistake that people make that I see is that they choose the most prominent wall in their living room and they get a huge TV (laughs) right across that. You've seen it, right? Right across from that, they put a large sofa and a recliner. And so their their living room becomes a movie theater. So every time (laughs) you come home, that huge TV is, is calling your name, you know, saying, watch me, watch me, watch me. And then it, it turns out that when you think about what fun thing you could do, you always immediately go to, let's watch something, right? So you turn your living room into a, um, a movie theater, a pretty cool to have a movie theater in your home. However, that's not going to help you socialize. And so don't make the TV the most prominent object in your living room. Don't make it the first thing you see when you walk in. And arrange the furniture in a way that it promotes conversation. And it also has to be versatile, right? Because the things that you want to do in a family room, right, is you want when your friends come over, you want them to be able to sit down comfortably and have a conversation. You also want to be able to uh, play cards or play table games. You also do want to play video games, if if that's what you like. You also do want to watch movies. Um, But sometimes you may want to just uh, sing karaoke, right? And, uh, and so there, there's so many things. Maybe you want to take a nap. Maybe you want to read a book. And so you need to, to go into a room, like the living room, and say, okay, what do I want to do here? What would make you, me really happy to do here? And then uh, choose your furniture and your arrangement so that can happen, right? And another mistake that I see uh, very commonly done, you know, which is associated with this, you have the TV, and then you have all these cables connected to the TV <laughs> the cables on the floor. You've seen this too, right? Oh, yeah. And it's like a jungle of cables. <laughs> and cables in feng shui, they have a symbology. And they're associated with your thoughts and your nervous system. And so people get more stressed out. And when, when I help people organize their cables, uh, they tell me, I am so relieved. And sometimes they tell me, I hadn't even noticed how stressed out I was until I organized the cables and I, I saw I was much more relaxed. Oh, wow. Moni, you gave me a very, very good... No, because you know why in Asia... I'm, I <laughs> live in Thailand, but I'm from the Philippines and both are the same. You go to a yeah. living room, they always have this huge TV and it's like the main part of the living room. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> and then you know if the person does and they're complaining i don't have friends you know, I never <laughs> friends, you know? nobody ever invites me anywhere <laughs> you, know? but, you, you have set up your mind to a mentality of just staying home okay in front of so moni where do you suggest to put the tv for example of course they don't have not everybody can afford an extra room to be like their movie theater <laughs> yeah. so where can they and put so, the tv if you can avoid it, don't put the TV across the sofa, right? Okay. So put it in an L shape compared to the sofa. And, uh, and another thing you can do is just cover up the TV. Now just get a beautiful piece of fabric, 
so that you can cover up the TV when it's not in use because it's also a problem. It ruins your interior design because when the TV is off, it's black. And so you would never go, like, would you go to a gallery and, uh, and just choose a gigantic uh, painting that is all black? <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't, right? Yes. And that's, that's the TV when it's off. And so get a beautiful piece of fabric to cover it up. You know, now there's also beautiful cabinets that for the TV that you can actually close doors. So you're not looking at it all the time. Oh, that's nice. That's nice. But Moni, the living room is for, you mentioned about fame, reputation, and social life. So that's, yes. is that what the living room for? Yes. And yeah, that's a, that's a symbolic connection. But there's also all, all these things that you want to do, you know, like all the activities I mentioned before. And, and I forgot to mention something else. A lot of people work out in the living room, right? <laughs> You and really so know like, you're, what you're doing, Moni. <laughs> <laughs> and so you, you got to think, you know, you, you got to think. And so, sometimes, you know, during COVID, when COVID first started, you know, they sent my kids home from school. And uh, the, during the lockdowns, well, we got to work out, right? And so we're working out in, in our living room. And so you, got, it's, you have to move things around, right? Like your coffee table needs to be something that you can push aside very easily. So that you can make room for a workout, for example. And so versatility is the most important word for your living room. Wow. I like that word. Yes. Yes. So now, but Moni, one last question for the living room. If there is something that they can put in the living room in order to bring peace, harmony, love, everything, or happiness or joy, because normally it's the first place in the, in the home, especially in the Philippines or even in, in Thailand, yes. that you can see in the home. So when you open the door... If there's one thing that they can put there, what is it? A good sofa. So if you don't have a sofa or at least a love seat, you don't have a living room. So like try and visualize any living room. If you take out the sofa and replace it with different kinds of chairs, you have a waiting room. <laughs> right? Your home becomes a building. <laughs> Now it's an office, right? It's a yeah. waiting room for a or something. And so get a comfortable sofa. Get, get something that really invites you to curl up with a blanket and a book and maybe a cup of cocoa, right? Uh, get that coziness. Because and also the, the, the symbol of the, of the sofa is super important because the sofa is the place where you're going to sit close with family members and cuddle. And so choose a good sofa. Thank you so much. That's nice. Now let's move to the next part of the, the, the house or the home, the dining yeah. room where yes. people eat. What's your take on the dining room? What is supposed to be there? Okay. So when you say like the dining room is where people eat, yes, not in that's the United right. States anymore. Ah. You know? Yeah. And it, I, I'm really worried because when I moved to this country over 20 years ago and I started doing feng shui, my main concern was convincing people not to eat watching TV. And so there was this trend that people were bringing in TVs to their dining room and they were just watching TV instead of talking to each other. And so my struggle in the beginning was, hey, would you please you know, find a way that you're not watching TV so that you can talk to each other? Because, and, and I, I imagine in the Philippines, it's similar to, I come from South America, right? In South America, the best part of the meal is often not the food, and the food is really good. <laughs> part of, of the course. meal is the conversations you have with your family. Yes. That is more important even than the food, right? That's right. Yes. So when I first came to this country, I was trying to teach people to do this, but it has changed. People don't even eat together anymore. In the last 20 years, that has changed. And so when every family member, like they might eat, have dinner together when the kids are little, but as soon as the kids are maybe 10 or 11 and they can use the microwave by themselves, people arrive at home at different times and they put something together to eat when they come home and they don't even eat together anymore, right? But, you know, they've done studies that families that eat together, their kids actually do a lot better in college, for example. There's all sorts of benefits, you know, to having dinner as a family. And so there, you, you got to make sure uh, that every person has a chair. Not a stool, you know, don't eat, <laughs> don't eat at the kitchen bar. Don't sit on high stools, sit in proper chairs with a back, right? And actually sit down to eat with your family. 
and and so there's a there's a lot of trends, you know, the things that happen, and they're actually not good feng shui. And uh, and one of those, and I don't know if, if you've seen this, but it's like having benches instead of individual chairs. Yes. Yeah, I, I, so I now, actually have it in my home in the Philippines. You have it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so when you are sitting on a bench and you have to get up to get a glass of water or whatever, you make everybody move. You know, like if you, if you need to get up, everybody has to move. And so it's important that everybody have their individual chair because oh, okay. it's, uh, it's symbolic of recognizing that every member of your family is an individual, right? And ah. so it's, uh, it's symbolic of giving people autonomy. Oh wow, that's 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 really really good. Okay, mm-hmm. wow, I love it. No, I you know what you're saying is actually really happening nowadays. And some people, even if they eat together, everyone is on the mobile phone. That too, you know. Like I think families should have a rule that you just can't bring devices to the table. Totally agree. Yeah, and and the thing is, you know, um, like our kids, they love dinner time. They just love it. And they love the conversations. And so that means that as a parent, you need to be able to create conversations that are interesting to your kids and teenagers. If your kids are bored to talk to you, that's, <laughs> that, that's that a big problem. That, yeah, and then you're, then you're not an interesting person, you know, so you need to be an interesting person. And that's part of, you know, of, uh, what I do with the Nice Steps to Fonche system is uh, is that at the same time that as you're working to turn your home into your dream home, on the other hand, you're working on yourself. So you, be a, you can be a more authentic, interesting person. Wow. Like, no, so, it's got easy. Yeah. So you said in a sofa, in a sofa, in a living room, a sofa is a must. So in a yeah. dining room, what is it? Well, a, a dining chair, I mean, dining table, right? Uh-huh. An actual dining table with individual chairs. So in, a dining room set. If there you don't you have a dining room set, you don't have a dining room. That's right. Right? If yes. you take that out of that room, it's not a dining room anymore. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Wow. I, I'm very excited, Moni. <laughs> now let's move to, this is my very favorite part of the, the home, the bathroom. Yeah. Okay. I love bathrooms. For me, it's it, because it's my father. My father said, at least from my father, <laughs> not, not this in general, but he says yeah. that you can measure the cleanliness of the family or the people who live there with the bathroom. That's what he told us. <laughs> yeah, and and in, even in businesses, you know, they, they have done studies over here in the U.S. And the people, they, they would actually stop going to a place if the bathroom was not clean one time. And so, like, you know, the, um, the restaurant change McDonald's, one of their claims to fame is that their bathrooms are clean. And so when people travel, they go that they know that they can stop by any McDonald's and the bathroom's gonna be clean. Oh, wow. And so even for business, right? But for the home, definitely. And so here's the thing, right? In um, do you wanna hear what the Chinese bathrooms were like? <laughs> I've been I've been to China <laughs> one well, time money. <laughs> but they were like thousands of years ago. Um well, <laughs> it's almost, you know, like, I think, 20 years ago when I went to China, long time ago in Beijing. Yeah. Thousands of years ago, right? Yeah. They actually had the outhouse connected to the pig pen. And the, the pigs would eat that. Can you imagine? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I can. Oh, I can vividly so, imagine it. <laughs> In the, in, in, in the original feng shui, the bathroom was not considered part of the house. Oh. It was like that. And, and actually, the grandmothers, you know, when plumbing first came to China, the grandmother was, was like, no, do not bring the bathroom into the house. That is unclean and it needs to stay outside of the house by the pig pen, right? And so in, so in feng shui, a bathroom is considered negative because it's a place for cleansing, Right. And because of the excretions and everything and the possible contamination and dirt and, and everything. But um, culturally, you know, in all cultures in the world, there was a bathroom and there was a toilet room originally, and they were separate, right? Yes. And so the, the bathroom had this spa vibration. The, it was just a room for the tub, 
right? Yes. And so the, the ritual of taking a bath was completely separate from, from that going thing. number one or going number two, <laughs> right? And so in our modern bathrooms, we have them together. And that's the, the greatest conflict that a bathroom presents. So I actually have a, a course on bathrooms and um, I have online courses, you know, so that people can take to, uh, to try and reconcile this, uh, um, this okay. aspect of the bathroom, right? And so, yeah, definitely keep it uh, super, super clean. You know, that is a must. And, uh, and also, um, for example, your, you have to put the seat down and the lid down before you flush. Yes. Okay. Because <laughs> they have done these studies. You know, now after the pandemic, we all know about aerosols. Whenever you flush the toilet, there's aerosols that go all over the room. You have to put that lid down before you flush. Otherwise, you end up with the pee and poo water on your toothbrush, on your brush, or whatever it is you have. <laughs> right? Yes. Yes. And so that is the most important thing. Train everybody in the family to put down the toilet seat and the toilet lid before they flush. And then I also recommend that you get something to cover up your toothbrushes so you keep that protected. And so it's, there's a lot we could talk about the bathroom, but those are the most important things. And, um, and also, you know, there's uh, certain activities, for example, doing your hair or doing your makeup. Is that something that in your culture uh, women do in the bathroom or do they have a separate area for that? It's a combination. There are some women who do it in the bathroom, but there are some who do it in the bedroom because they have yeah. the dresser. But, yes. Yeah, but so some people still in, do it in the bathroom, Moni. Yeah. So I grew up in a culture where that was not a bathroom activity, right? And it shouldn't be a bathroom activity for oh. several reasons. Um, and so I do recommend taking out makeup and hair out of the bathroom because it creates a lot of arguments, right? Okay. You should not spend too much time in the bathroom if you have a limited number of bathrooms. So more ho most homes, you have more people than bathrooms, right? And the source yes. of arguments yeah. is you need to use the bathroom and somebody else is in the bathroom. And so if you're going to do your whole makeup and hair in the bathroom, that's going to take 20 to 30 minutes that only, only that, that person is using the bathroom, right? And when other people need to use the bathroom, that creates conflict. But also makeup is not, uh, does not do well near water, oh. right? <laughs> if you get water on your makeup, it ruins your makeup. That's and right. then all the electric things that you use to, uh, to get your hair done, they shouldn't be near water. Yeah, you might you there. might end up electrocuted. Electrocuted, <laughs> yes. And so the, the other certain activities I actually recommend you take outside of the bathroom. And the feedback from my clients is they're so much happier when they actually create in you know like in their bedroom or to the side of their bedroom, like in an alcove. They create an area for hair and makeup. They're so much happier, and their self esteem goes up because <laughs> yeah. oh. they're not doing things in a hurry. Yeah. Wow. I have a question, Moni, because I do my grooming in the bathroom. <laughs> yeah, but I don't do guys, makeup, but I like yeah, my for, perfume for guys is it's there. Different because it's faster, right? You're not gonna stay there a long time, you know. So it's different. And also, you know, like if you're shaving, you know, shaving is something you should probably do in the bathroom. Yes. But uh, putting curls on your hair or straightening your hair—that's something that you shouldn't be doing in the bathroom, in my opinion. Okay, there you go. But I have this activity that I do in the bathroom. I read. Is that recommended, Moni? No, no, it's not recommended. Okay, so it's a it's a mixed. <laughs> this is this is a conversation that's like not for the dinner table, right? And um, this part of the conversation I'm talking yes. about that. But here's the thing. So it's been found. That when you need to go number two, do you use number one and number two over there? Like yes. number one for pee, number two for poop, right? Yes. And so when you have to go number two, if you're reading, it's easier. That's right. Right? It is easier. And some people have gotten so used to reading something that they actually can't go unless they're reading something. But you shouldn't use the bathroom as a reading room. 
right? <laughs> it's okay to it's okay to keep a book or a magazine in the bathroom so that you can uh, uh, read a little something and that relaxes your body so your body can go number two faster. But once you're done, you need to clean up and get out of there. And so don't be like okay because is the only room in the home where I can have peace. <laughs> I'm going to read my 400 page novel in the bathroom. You know, that's not what it's for. I see. And then, and there, you know, sorry. Sorry, Moni, you go ahead. They have kept in the bathroom, they will uh, pick up the smell from the bathroom. So after you put something in the bathroom, you shouldn't go back on your bookcase. Okay. But I've heard, at least in my yeah. knowledge, some people, they said it's good to have plants in the bathroom. Is that yes. recommended? Yes, yes, it's good to have plants in the bathroom. Okay, any reason for that, Moni? Um, yes. um, bathrooms are considered yin, and uh, they have an, an excess of metal and water element. And so when you put a plant there, it, uh, it corrects the excess of water because um, plants feed from water, and it just makes a it uplifts the energy of a bathroom and it makes it just feel more alive, right? I see. Wow, nice. So a sofa for the living room, uh-huh. a dining table and chairs for chairs, the not living room. Chairs, that's tools, right? Yeah, and that's tools. Yeah. yeah, in the dining room. And what uh-huh. is for the bathroom? Well, for the bathroom is the habit. The most important thing is the habit of putting the seat down and putting the lid down before you flush. There you go. And then, you know, making sure your toothbrushes are protected. I see. And of but course, is, yes. I'm sorry. Yes. Moni, is it recommended to have a bathtub? Because some people, they really love to, to have a bathtub in the bathroom. Yes, I mean, it's great to have a bathtub. You know, there's, a, um, I think old people need to take a bath once in a while, right? Not just a shower, but actually take a bath. Yes. It is recommended. Now, if you were really rich, you would have a, a large bathroom where you have a bathing area that is separate from the toilet area, right? Uh, but in most homes, that's not going to be possible. And in the United States, the way they do the plumbing, the bathtub is usually next to the toilet. Yes. Which is a problem, you know. So um, a good opaque curtain, a shower curtain that you can put to that side so when you're taking a bath, you don't see the toilet. That's really important. You know what I mean? Yes, yes. Yeah. Or if you have, uh, you can also get like um, shower, I mean, bathtub. They're like shower doors, but they go on top of the bathtub. Yes. And so, and you open them in a way that when you're in the bathtub, um, you can smell the toilet, right? Okay. And so even if you're really clean, and I can tell you this because I grew up in a developing country, this probably would not be a problem in the United States. If you keep the bathroom clean, and if you even you're taking a bathtub and it's just next to the toilet, you're probably not going to smell the toilet. But in the developing world, you know, there can be all sorts of issues with the way the sewage was done. That even in the cleanest bathroom, sometimes you get a little bit of a smell from the toilet. And so that's why, you know, like either uh, collect the shower curtain on that side so it blocks the smells and you can see the toilet or get sliding doors. And that divide that area, you know, so like if you are taking the bath here, then you have the, the shower door in the bathroom, the toilet on that side. There you go. Wow. Thanks for that advice, <laughs> especially on my reading part. Now, now let's move to the next room, Moni, which is the bedroom. Yeah. Uh-huh. The master bedroom or kids' bedrooms? Oh, wow. I only have one bedroom. <laughs> let's okay. let's let's talk about the master bedroom first. The master bedroom, right? Yes. And so are you married? No. If you're in a committed relationship or if you are single and want to be in a committed relationship, the most important thing in the bedroom is equality. To show equality. So you need to have room to access the bed on both sides. No pushing the bed to one wall, right? So the one partner has to climb over the other partner just to get up to go to the bathroom. So you have to have room on both sides. You have to have nightstands with lamps that are equal because the most important thing, you have to have a bed with a headboard, not just a mattress, but a bed with a headboard. And that headboard needs to be solid and made of wood. And so you need to emphasize stability and equality in the master bedroom. That is the most important thing. And so it's not that partners are equal, but that they are equally important. So 
is not it's not um, literal equality, it's equality of importance. And so people need to understand, and this is um, for a lot of women, they, they're they okay saying, oh, okay, so I see my needs are as important as the needs of my spouse. But when it comes to their desires, they, they can see the equality. They can see that their desires are equally important to the desires of the husbands. And the, the condition for success over the long term is equality, ah. equality of importance. Yes. So you do that by setting up the bedroom in this way. Okay. So because you mentioned about like single or, or married yes. or want to have a partner or committed relationship. So I have now different questions. <laughs> yes. Moni, what do you recommend for people single, whether men or women single, what, what they should have in their be- bedroom? Okay. It depends. If they are single and they want to be in a partnership, they need to arrange, they need to make the bedroom ready. So they do everything as if they already had the partner. So there's room for the partner to move in, right? Now, if they are single and they want to be single, uh, then, <laughs> <laughs> then just one night stand. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. And those who are married, so the one that you mentioned that they should, yes. I see. But, yeah. but do you know some, People, they only have the mattress, but they don't have the headboard. And it's on the floor. And the mattress is on the floor. Is that okay? Yeah. Well, that it depends culturally, right? So, for example, I, am, I know the Japanese. Yes. And some people in Korea, right? They, uh, they have the tatami that they, they fold. And that's okay because that's a, a cultural um, that's what they do custom, in their countries. It's a custom, right? And, yes. uh, and so, like some of those apartments, they're really little. So you put you get the mattress out and roll it out, and then you have to put it in a closet during the days because that becomes your living room, right? And so in those cases, yeah, you know that, and it's if it's part of your culture, but if it is not, then it's not a good idea. And so some people here, you know, in like a, they're kind of hippies, you know, they're like free spirits. Yes, uh, and the, they don't want to have a bed because they're like that's for that's for boring, conservative people, you know, not, <laughs> not for serious like me. But the the needs of people are the same, no matter what their ideology is, you know. And you just sleep um, better, more secure in a bed with a headboard. But I mean, when you're a college student, right? That's okay. Uh, if you are um, first starting out with your first apartment, that's okay. But as time goes on, you need to make sure you get the furniture that would make you comfortable. That's right. Yeah. That's right. I see. And how about for the children's room? Well, for children's rooms, the most important thing is, uh, or the two functions, right, are rest and play. And so the, the worst mistake that people make is uh, decorating the room for a character from TV. For a <laughs> character from TV. That's the worst mistake. Superheroes. <laughs> Superheroes or princesses, you know, whatever that, that is. And so um, children like bright contrasted colors, right? But uh, they're not good for them for rest. And so what you want to have is, uh, is a room in pastel colors. So happy, light colors. And you can have accents, you know, you can have a poster, you can have a toy, you know, the beloved characters from TV or movies, but don't do the whole theme. Mm. And make sure that there's room to play. Don't do bunk beds. Bunk beds kill a room. Oh. And so if you, you can do trundle beds, you know, like you have a bed and then there's a drawer that comes yes. out. There's no mattress or trundle beds are okay. Bunk beds are not okay. A bunk bed eliminates half of the room spatially. You think you're going to gain space and you actually lose it. Yeah. Oh, okay. You mentioned about the colors, but what, generally speaking, Moni, what's the best color for people to have a good rest or to have a good night's sleep? What's the best color for the bedroom? For adults, uh, neutral earth tones. And for children, light pastel colors. Okay. And uh, also, for any bedroom, don't go too cool in colors. You know, don't go dark blue and, and gray, things like that. But especially for 
couples. You want warmth in the bedroom of a couple. You don't want cool colors. Unless you live in a really hot area with no air conditioning or fans. Yeah, that's a different thing. <laughs> that's a different thing. Then you might need the cool colors, you know, just to counteract the environment. That's it. Yes. Moni, sofa for the living room. Dining table and chairs in the dining room. Yes. How about for the bedroom? Aside from okay. the bed. <laughs> yeah, well, you need a bed for two people. And that, that should go without saying, but you have to say it. Because sometimes, you know, like people get like a full-size bed. A full-size bed is a bed for one person. So if you have the room, you should get at least a queen-size or a king-size bed. Um, but it, it needs to be a bed where two people can sleep comfortably, right? And so in what makes the bedroom is the bed. So if you can only have one piece of furniture, you have to have the bed. And then the nightstands. Let's see. Is it advisable to have a mirror in the bedroom? If you can avoid having a mirror in the bedroom, it's better. People tend to sleep better when there are no mirrors in the bedroom. But if you need to have a mirror, say, for example, because you're doing your makeup there or you have going to have a full length mirror. So when you put on your clothes, you can check yourself. Um, if there's no problem sleeping, it's OK to have a large mirror in the bedroom as long as you can see yourself in the bed. So when you're in bed, you shouldn't be able to see yourself in the mirror. Oh. Yeah. Is there a reason for that, Moni? Uh, there's a, a very practical reason. When, when you first wake up in the morning, that's not your best. So, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you might be scared off by your, your own face. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh. And then you're like, my partner must really love me. <laughs> I see this in the morning. <laughs> yeah. How come? <laughs> no, because, you know, in the Philippines, there are even some bedrooms with mirrors on the ceiling. Yeah, that's not good. Um, it makes the ceiling seem too high, which creates an imbalance of yin and yang. But also the, the impression that things are upside down is also not good. It's like not good for your mind. Mirrors need to be completely vertical. You know, it's another thing that's in fashion right now is they just get these large mirrors and lean them on the wall. That's very bad feng shui. The mirror needs to be completely vertical or horizontal, like on a table, you can have a mirror that faces up, but you shouldn't have a mirror in the ceilings and you should not have mirrors at an angle. But is it good to have mirror in, the, because in my home in the Philippines, I have the mirror in the dining room. Yes, it's excellent to have a mirror in the dining room. Oh, thank you. Wow, you made me really, really happy and satisfied because I have this big mirror by the yeah. dining room near that's the a, table. That's awesome. Yeah. I forgot the kitchen, Moni. <laughs> the what? Oh, I forgot the kitchen. The kitchen. Yes. Actually, what is the, kitchen, the kitchen is the room that represents wealth in your home. Wow, kitchen represents wealth. Yes. Yeah, it's the most expensive room to build. Like the, the price by square foot or a square meter of the kitchen, sometimes it's four times and the, the price of the rest of the home. Because you have, you have to have special floors, you have to have the cabinets, you know, the, uh, the piping, the installations, the appliances. And so it's the room that represents wealth. And so it's important uh, to have a sense of abundance in the kitchen and especially reminders of natural life, you know, like images of trees or forests or gardens are really good. Um, if you can have live plants, especially plants that you can eat, for example, you have like a window garden is excellent to have in the kitchen because the kitchen is, um, is connected to wealth. And you don't, uh, you know, like a lot of people today, they're like, oh, the love attraction, the movie, The Secret. You're familiar with that, right? Yes. <laughs> like you're going to manifest, you know, you have these affirmations. And so you cannot attract wealth. So like, I'm going to attract wealth. No, you need to grow your wealth. So it's an, an active participation thing. You need to grow your wealth. And so you need to emphasize the idea of growth in the kitchen. And the best way to do that is have a plant, especially if it's a plant that you can eat. For example, if you have like a little cilantro plant on your windowsill that you can actually, you know, take a, a couple yeah. of leaves and add to your food. You know, the, the feeling that gives you is really, really empowering. Nice. Wow. I never heard about this. 
I, I'm sorry, Moni. No, you go ahead. Yeah, I never heard about this about the kitchen to have that abund abundance, and then it's actually for the symbol of wealth. Any color that should should be the color of the kitchen? Well, you should avoid what's in fashion right now, because right <laughs> now, what's in fashion is all white and yeah, gray, that's right. right? So that's not good. Because that's the metal element and metal cuts wood and wood is the element of wealth and is the element in the kitchen. And so what you want is earth tones or uh, the colors of the wood element, which are light blues and greens, teals, aqua, turquoise. And those are, are the best colors. For the kitchen. Yes. Oh, wow, nice. But, it, but it, you also have to consider people's taste, right? You know, like if a if a person hates green, they shouldn't paint their kitchen green. Yeah, it should okay. be a color they love. Yeah. That's right. That's right. <laughs> That's right. For the home in general, Moni, any color that you advise? Well, you know, let's not talk about one color, but let's talk about two approaches to the color in the home. Oh, I right. like that. So one yes. approach is to have your whole home with one theme. Right, so that where all the walls of your home are painted the same color, maybe just with a, a couple of accent uh, walls here and there, right? And uh, and in that case, if you want to do that, you need to stay with um, like a beige of white or a soft earth tone. And then there's another approach to color, which is that you give um, like each room its personality, right? Yeah. And then in that case, you do an analysis, you know, in the nice test of feng shui system, uh, step five is harmonizing color, shapes, and materials. So you do an analysis that has to do with the personal needs of, of the people that live there, their preferences and taste in color, uh, even their constitution, their history, right? And also what is good for the particular room, you know? So if you, you want to promote rest, there's a certain types of colors. If you want to promote activity, there's different colors. But, um, and here's one thing, you know, the, the type of feng shui that is more into astrology and uh, numerology, uh, their advice on colors is really off in the interior design sense. So the advice they give to their clients ends up producing spaces that make people go, huh, what happened here? <laughs> going, wow, this is awesome, right? And so like, if, for example, they say, oh, you were born in this year. And uh, so you need this color. So you need to paint your living room yellow. And, uh, and that's not a good way to choose colors. And so we look, um, I, in my system, I also train people to become feng shui consultants. And, and so um, myself and all the consultants that I have licensed in the nice steps feng shui system, it's a very complex process to choose colors, to help a client choose colors. Wow, that's interesting. But of course, later, Moni, you have to mention your website because I'm sure some yes. people will be interested to study online and I myself, I might check that yes. <laughs> and then they can get something from your website. Another thing is, of course, that's because in, in like example in the Philippines, one of the things that they don't like to have, they said it depends. You have to ask like you, a feng shui master or consultant, the aquarium in the house, is it advisable? It depends. It, it depends on many factors. So in general, it's a good symbol. It's good for wealth. It's good for money. It's really good because there's movement, you know, so it activates the life force. And there are many good things about an aquarium. But the aquarium has to be in proportion to the house. And so it shouldn't be so big that it overpowers everything else, right? And so if you live in a small home, maybe all you need is a beta fish in a, in a fish bowl, right? And, uh, and so it needs to be in proportion to the home. And uh, also you need to make sure that the fish are healthy and that you are able to keep it clean. And so in some places I've been, you know, they, they have a, an aquarium that should be beautiful, but the water is foggy because they don't, don't clean it. You know, they have a good filter or sometimes the fish die. So having dead fish is really bad for the shui. So, and that, so in general, yes, it's a good thing but it's very hard to take care of. Like you really have to study. It's not a matter that you just buy an aquarium and you have it, you plug it and there you That's go. That's it. <laughs> you actually, yeah, you actually have to be devoted to it. Okay. Yeah. Another question that most people are, I always hear this from people, the number yes. of steps for the stairs. 
well, what's the best number of steps? Because I always like, at least in Asian context, I'm, I'm not sure with the Western countries, but at least in Asian context, I always hear people like counting when they step on the stairs. They even counting and they say, oh, you should not be like this. It shouldn't be like that. So what is the, I don't want to say perfect number, but what's the advisable number of steps okay. for the stairs? So stairs, just by their very nature, they're unsafe, right? Because you could roll down the stairs. That's so right. they're always considered a problem in Feng Shui. And I understand, you know, in some cultures, they consider this number of steps is lucky or auspicious and this other number is inauspicious. However, for safety, you need to go by the code, <laughs> okay? Oh. So the steps are determined by how much distance you have from one floor to the next floor and how high the risers need to be in the, in the flat areas, you know, so that you are safe, the safest when you go up and down. Now, in the United States, in, in the Western world, that's usually seven steps to the landing and then another seven steps uh, to the top floor. And, but not every house has that, you know, so sometimes you find here like there's 10 or 11 steps from one floor to the other. And those tend to be kind of unsafe staircases. And so a lot of homes were built before the current codes, the safety codes, right? And so in Feng Shui, you know, we do have to address a, a lot of imbalances, yin and yang problems, excesses and deficiencies that are created by staircases. So one of the biggest problems you have is if you have a staircase with no landing. Yeah, but and then don't worry about the number of steps. Just make sure that your staircase is built to code and that, that it is safe. See, because in the Philippines they even count oro plata mata, oro plata mata. Really? You know? Yes, in the Philippines, and it should be because oro. I think it's is it gold? Gold. gold. And then yeah, silver and, and silver. and then that oro well, plata mata. What is mata I, money? Mata is, has two names. Uh, it can be a, a plant or it can be death. So I, I don't know in what context they're using it. They're using death in that context. They're using death. So here's the thing. If in your culture something is bad luck, you better avoid it, right? And so, for example, in Chinese culture, the number four is uh, bad luck because the word for the number four sounds like the word for death. Right. But in the Western culture, there's no issues with the number four. Uh, the number people here are afraid of is the number 13. Yes. So if you build a house with 13 steps, people are going to have an issue with it. Right? <laughs> in China, if it's a multiple of four, people are going to have an issue with it. But in another culture, it wouldn't be an issue. However, if it's an issue for your culture, you should listen to it. So take into consideration the cultural background. Yes. Yeah. What does it mean to you? Let's see. Moni, before I ask you my standard questions for my guests, because we're almost there, I don't want to, sure. to get most of your time. But this is a personal question for myself because I'm planning, because I just I'm just going to start, I'm going to start my sex coaching and sex consulting career. Oh, okay. Yeah, and I'm planning to have my own office for this to, to see my clients. Yeah. Any advice on what should I put in my office? It's, it's about sexuality. It's about intimacy. So that's that's the topic. Uh -huh. Sex is the topic. Well, so what, what I can tell you, is a, it's a loaded topic, right? It's like if you, go, um, if you go to a party and people ask you, well, what do you do for a living? <laughs> say, well, I'm a sex consultant. People are like, what? <laughs> <laughs> what is this? <laughs> you know? <laughs> And people's yes. minds go this way and that way. And then they're wondering, you're like, is this illegal and stuff? And so because it's such a loaded topic, you have to create an ambience of safety and, um, and integrity, right? So you, have, you want to frame things in a, in a way to show that it's completely moral what you're doing, right? And so that people don't get freaked out. And so you, you really need to emphasize that. So should you have a poster of the Kama Sutra? in you know, positions, you know, the Indian book. Of yeah, sexuality. that's right. I have that book. <laughs> yeah, having the book is okay, right? But should you have a poster of it? It depends. If, uh, if the kind of, of uh, sexual counseling you do is for people to get more satisfaction, uh, maybe yes. But if, if what you're trying to do is create more intimacy, then maybe no, right? And so you need to decide what you're going to uh, project through your branding. 
And so that's going to depend on that. But, you know, whenever there's a, there's a perception, when there's like a preconception of something negative around what you do, you want to face it head on and project the opposite. Right. And so, for example, one thing that I would do if I was in, in your situation is I would have certificates on the walls um, that would give me credibility. Let's see. Last, any advice on the color about sex, Moni? Not, not necessarily for the office or for the room. Any call, like just a symbol for sex that can be, you think, can be successful? Um, that, again, depends on the culture. And so um, in traditional feng shui, you want to promote warmth and uh, like anything with red, a leading red following with earth tones, right? Um, in South America, Red is associated with the red zone and <laughs> the part of the city where there's a lot of rays. Yes. Where the workers are, right? And so in South America, you will want to tone that down, right? Uh, because of that. So you have to look at, uh, at your culture and uh, you have to look at what are the psychology of colors, you know, what uh, emotions the colors generate. And also, you know, I always recommend when you're starting a business, go see what your colleagues are doing, people who are already established in your field, and see what kind of an emotional response you get when you go to their website and you look at their colors, you know, what kind of a response do you get? Nice. Thank you so much, Moni. Now, my standard questions. Okay. <laughs> Moni, the first one. With your experiences, you visited a lot of homes, you've met people and give them advices. Yes. What, what's the best or the greatest lesson you, you've learned in life? Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a difficult question. Um, I think uh, what I would say is uh, you need to always be yourself. And, and I know this uh, from feng shui, you know, because it's based in ancient Chinese philosophy. Every person comes to their life uh, with life missions, things that they, they want to do for themselves and things that they are asked to do for others, right? And you were designed by heaven uh, so that your authentic self fulfills these life missions. So don't try to be anybody else. Constantly work on discovering and uncovering and revealing more of who you are authentically rather than trying to meet other people's expectations. Very well said. Moni, the second one. Of course, you've made a lot of decisions for sure in the past. Can yeah. you share one, one decision that you made in the past and has a huge impact on who you are now? Okay, so um, I studied architecture in my homeland in Ecuador, right? And when I moved to the United States, I found I would not be able to practice architecture unless I went back to school for five years. And I had already been in school for over six years. So I didn't want to do that, right? So I made the decision. First, you know, I made the decision to not do that. And then I became interested in feng shui. And I think the biggest decision I made in feng shui was between choosing to do this feng shui that is more astrology and numerology or to do feng shui in alignment with ancient Chinese medicine. And, and I chose, you know, the, as you know, um, to healing. practice feng shui as a part of Chinese medicine. And, uh, and then I developed my own school. And it, it was a very um, brave thing to do at the time, right? Because it's a lot more comfortable when you can just find a master to teach you everything they know and you have them to back you. But I had to do a lot of research because there's been so much superstition and contradictions in feng shui and that I actually had to do a lot of research and a lot of testing to actually find out what worked. Yes. And the last one. Moni, you're an author. If you are going to write another book, or maybe someone else is going to write a book, but this time about your life, what will it be and what will be the title? Of, uh, a book about me, if somebody else wrote it? Yes, or maybe you write it, but what, well, what will I, be I the actually, title? I have written several books, and my latest book that I published is called Room by Room, from Shea Secrets for a Happy Life. And it's the story of four generations and uh, three homes. And so in that book, I go room by room, like we did in this interview, right? Yes. And so the, the foyer, the living room, the dining room, the kitchen, and so forth. And, and I'm talking about the home of my grandmother, who had a really uh, strong instinct for feng shui. 
And then I, I also go uh, over the home of my parents, you know, which unfortunately was a very dysfunctional home. And I wanted to do that to show the contrast between how people with good feng shui live their lives and what people with bad feng shui do. And then the third home is the home uh, that my husband and I have where we are raising our own family. And the, so the fourth generation would be my kids. And so the, um, the book, you know, the, it talks about growing up in a dysfunctional family, but it's a, a book that is full of hope because feng shui really can help you heal. Uh, when you, um, if you have lived a, a very challenging period, you know, other that you suffered abuse as a child, or if you were in a relationship that was very destructive, you know, as a young person, that you can replace the memories. You can replace the bad memories because every room has memories, right? Yes. So whenever you walk into your kitchen today, you have memories of your parents' kitchen and you have memories of your grandparents' kitchens and you have memories of your friends' kitchens, right? Uh, you have memories of all the homes you've lived in before the kitchen. That's and right. so you can replace any, any places that have bad memories. You can replace those with good memories. You can erase those by recording over them. And so that, that is super important. And so it's, it's a book that talks about abuse, but it's also a book that is full of hope. And there's a section that tells you what you should do so that you have your dream home. Wow. So it's already available. But what if, yes. but what if you write another one? Uh, I'm actually finishing up another book, oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> which is uh, not about the rooms in the home, but about landscaping. And it's called The Greenhouse, and it's based on, a, it's a happier book because it's about my early, early childhood, when we lived in a home that was very traditional and uh, with huge gardens around it. And, uh, and so um, it's about creating outside environments that really nurture you. Nice. Yeah. Good luck. And <laughs> thank you. Probably it's going to be a bestseller. <laughs> Hopefully, yes. <laughs> Moni. Thank you so, so much for everything you have shared. And of course, please, if people want to connect with you or you said you have online courses and they want to check all the materials that you offer to the people about Feng Shui, Feng Shui yeah. please, this is your time. Please share your website. Thank you so much for inviting me, Arne. It has, has been a great time spending with you. So my website is 9stepstofengshui.com. Uh, but you can also get there by typing spacearrangement.com. And so that you get to my website and blog. And when you get there, there's going to be a pop-up window. And then you can sign up for my freebie, which is a, a free Bagua map, which is how we assign the life areas in Feng Shui. Uh, but I also have other freebies. And so when you're on my website, uh, you can also um, uh, click on freebies at the top menu. And you can choose, you know, there's a, there's a lot of webinars and documents that can help you. My favorite is the new one I just created. Uh, so for people who are listening to this or who are watching us and are thinking, oh my gosh, how am I going to remember all this? I actually have a document with all of this. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah. and so it's called Five Ways to Upgrade Your Home Right Now. So go to my website, 9stepstofengshui.com. Or spacearrangement.com is going to redirect you there. And, and that just, you know, get the freebie, join my mailing list so that you can be in touch and, and so that you can learn. It's really a profound experience when you use the home as a healing tool. But also, uh, for people who don't have good feng shui, the home is a drain. And your home should be your supportive partner. Your home should be nourishing and catapulting you into success. In the, instead of being in that place that is just taking time and energy away from you. And it can be done with feng shui. Oh. Thank you so much. And I'm sure they're going to visit. I myself will visit your, your website one of these days to get more information. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you so, so much, Moni. And to my light mates, I'm sure you've learned a lot from this episode. And remember this, wherever you live, of course, it's not about the place, but it's about the love that you put, the joy that you share with the people you live with. And whether you're going to have that peace of mind, it doesn't depend on the walls. It, that, it depends on how you live your life and with the people around you. I hope you learned something about today's Feng Shui's episode. <clears throat> and until my next episode, 
Lifemates, listen and learn.